So today we have a very special treat. We're here to talk about uh, sweep nets, right? The, the name of this workshop is called Get in the Bag. So it's all about sweep net training and learning about the type of insect life that's out there in the field. And I think it's important to start off by discussing why we're here today. Why are we doing this? Why are we sampling the populations of these fields? Right? And it kind of, for all those people that, that are, you know, in industry, I mean, everybody here is in industry, so everybody except for one here. <laughs> Michael's from, from my class at AWC, so uh, for you, Michael. So for, you know, the history of, you know, pesticides in this country, uh, after World War II, we got really good at creating uh, great pesticides that killed all kinds of insects, right? I mean, we had a big malaria problem in this country, in Florida, but then we had this, you know, re remarkable chemicals like DDT that helped clean that up for us. And so we don't have things like that anymore. And it worked really great for a while, but then what we started to see is a resurgence of, uh, of resistance to these chemicals. And then, uh, uh, so you have less tools in your arsenal. Uh, so out of that was kind of born the IPM movement or the Integrated Pest Management Movement, where we look at what's going on in the field and we adjust our response strategy to uh, address the specific need, basically swinging as small of a hammer or as more of a precise of a hammer as we can instead of using a giant sledgehammer to crush everything. And so uh, today we've, we've got some specialists that are visiting with us in the, uh, to help us understand how to sample our fields appropriately so that we can use the uh, existing IPM strategies that are out there uh, more appropriately. Because a lot of these strategies are based on what's going on out in the field and knowing how many predators how many beneficials, and then adjusting your chemistries to, uh, to match the need. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Peter Ellsworth is a full specialist and professor at the University of Arizona. He is an IPM coordinator and director of Arizona Pest Management Center at the University of Arizona Department of Entomology at Maricopa Ag uh, Agricultural Center. Dr. Ellsworth developed science-based IPM solutions through applied ecological investigations and organized outreach programs of cooperative extension with interest in the integration of chemical technologies and biological controls. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ellsworth, you have the floor. All right. Thank you, Robert. And thank you for co-sponsoring and getting this workshop together. Uh, you guys can sit in the shade if you want or get in the shade. It's not an endurance test. You know, I was looking up on my records and it's actually been a decade since we've run a workshop like this that focuses on the sampling methods themselves in, in, in more detail, and specifically the sweep net. And uh, it is absolutely critical to the work that a PCA does in, in, a, in a cotton grower's field. Uh, there's so much information to be had and 10 years ago, I thought it was important that we uh, make sure the industry knew, especially for new PCAs, people coming into the industry, people for, coming from other parts of the country or world, that they understood what a uh, proper sweep technique uh, looks like. So we developed a little short, which Macy, if you could help me get those distributed out or get some minions to distribute. Uh, I have a one page short that, that goes over what I'm going to talk about here, so you can take this home with you or you can follow along. But a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago, it was important to know because if nothing else, you could track your key number one yield limiting pest, which is ligus bugs in cotton. Ligus have been the number one pest since uh, roughly about 1997 when things transitioned over to BT cotton more completely and pink borm was, was more or less getting out of the picture. So ligus is really the thing that can take a bite out of your crop and 10 years ago that was true, that's true even today. What's changed is the technology has changed. Now you have Thrive On Cotton that's available and it controls ligus bugs. And we'll talk about that a little bit later if there's time. 
But more importantly, we, in the, in the intervening decade, my lab invested a great deal of time to study the predator complex that's present in cotton. In fact, we've been set, studying it for 25 years, but for the last decade, we were trying to arrive at specific relationships between the number of predators in your field and the number of pests in your field. Now, we focused on white flies, our other key pest. That's a quality limiting pest, the one that can potentially deliver excess sugars that drop onto our lint and contaminate and foul our lint. And uh, these white flies are on these leaves in every cotton field. And so we, we developed a relationship between predators and prey and, and created what we call predator thresholds. Now, I just read a paper just this week that was published uh, in another part of the world uh, where instead of calling them thresholds, they call them inaction thresholds because in a sense, Whereas a ligus threshold, if you follow a ligus threshold, you know what it means when you're above it, you're gonna spray. But when you're above a predator threshold, it's actually just the opposite. You're not gonna spray. It's, a pre it's, a, it's an inaction threshold. But nonetheless, we developed predator thresholds, which we'll spend a, a great deal of time talking about here once we go over the basic techniques of a, of a sweep. So, first and foremost, you need the equipment. And I'm so pleased that BASF is sponsoring and, and was generous enough to bring out some sweep nets to give away. So if you haven't got a good sweep net or the one's getting tired and old, um, please get a new one. Because first thing you gotta do is check the tip, make sure there's no holes in it. And they do develop over time. And unless you've been darning socks from a generation ago, you're probably gonna wanna get a new bag. Uh, the bags are removable, they are washable. Um, you need a good sturdy canvas bag because you're, you're sweeping a fairly um, robust plant canopy that's out there. The next thing you need to observe is the diameter of the sweep net. This is what I was asking uh, Jeff whether he had regulation ones or not. I hope so. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, I mean this predates me, sweep nets have been in use here, I don't know, at least since the 70s. Um, I, I arrived here in the 90s. Um, but the standard has always been a 15 inch diameter. If you haven't got a net that's a 15 inch diameter, you're running the risk of acquiring information that is slightly different than what we would expect. Um, and, and that's maybe significant here where you border another country, and that's Mexico. I work a lot in, in Mexicali Valley in northern Mexico, and for whatever reason, they think our nets are too big. And uh, I see 12 inch nets, I see 10 inch nets, and I'll have guys over there say, well, you know, these are my numbers, what should I do? I said, well, I don't know. I, we haven't done any of that research on a 10-inch net. You need to be using a 15-inch net. So we regularly distribute them over there, get them back onto the 15-inch net. Good sturdy rod uh, to, to, to manipulate the, the uh, net is also a must. Uh, I know some of them get sold. I don't think it's sold anymore with metal. Hopefully your, yours are wooden dowels, which is ideal. You get metal ones, put them in the back of the truck, you're gonna get third degree burns the next time you grab your, your net. Uh, all right, so 15 inch diameter net. After that, used to, in the very beginning, I tried to teach people to sweep like me. And then I realized, well, I don't need people to sweep like me. I need them to sweep according to the, to the goal of a sweep. And I actually don't care what you look like doing it. And you know, especially if you start off with new people, but even some seasoned guys have some interesting techniques. You know, they look a little different. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they are achieving the goal. So what's the goal of a good sweep? So there's several factors you need to consider, and it seems silly to pull a plant out of a field when the field's right there, but we're gonna do it anyways. The first thing I like to talk about is angle of attack, okay? Uh, when you're sweeping a field, you don't wanna be sweeping down here. You don't wanna be sweeping up here. You wanna be sweeping at a depth uh, or, I'm sorry, at an angle that is perpendicular to the ground, okay? Perpendicular to the ground or slightly open, if you understand the term slightly open, where the net is slightly open. What we don't want to see is people starting to close down on their sweep, because under those conditions you can start to throw, throw your sample to the ground rather than scooping it up in your net. So at the point of attack, that means at any moment at which you're contacting foliage, you want to be at least vertical, or slightly open. All right, so angle of attack is important. That's, that's an important goal. Depth of your sweep, which I started to talk about, is also important. You don't wanna be sweeping below the, the canopy top, and you don't wanna be just skimming the top. I like to tell people you're sweeping 
In your 15 inch net, you're sweeping a 12 inch volume. You want to, you want to leave about a three inch, steady that for me, Gordon. You want to leave up about a three inch gap, which I like to think of as about the size of your fist, all right? Just an air pocket above. That ensures you're not getting too low uh, and gets you the full 12 inch volume. You okay holding that for me? Yeah. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so, angle of tack, depth. After that, there's, there's really only two things. One really important one, and that's the force. And that's, that just comes down to feel. And uh, these guys know it, that have been doing it for years. If you're sweeping, you know, match head square cotton, it's very tender and young, you can't come roaring in there like Paul Bunyan. You're gonna be breaking terminals and, and hurting things. So you're always adjusting the speed, tempo, or force of your sweep. So how do we measure its success? The only way I could come up with it in teaching this to young, young uh, technicians and PCAs is that uh, the, re the result is what matters. And you don't want to get through 25 sweeps, which is a standard sample, a subsample of 25 sweeps. You don't want to complete your 25 sweeps in, a, in, a, in flowering cotton without getting at least some breakage of some leaves, maybe the occasional square or two. You want to have plant material in the tip of your bag. If you go through 25 sweeps and you have none, you're not sweeping hard enough. And if you go through and half your bag is loaded up and you're chopping down plants and you've broken terminals, which will happen, you're sweeping too hard. Now, why is that important? It's because every field is different. Water status, variety, crop development, every aspect is different in how they harden off. So it's really the result that matters. I can't tell you by looking while you're sweeping whether you're sweeping too hard or not. I can tell you after you got your 25 sweeps in your bag whether it looks good or not. You know, young cotton, you know, as long as you have little bits and pieces in there, you're fine. Cotton of this size, you should be getting two or three leaves or more. You know, maybe a little ball of, um, of material. Now, in a field like this, it's cut out. We have a lot of what we call bloom tags. At least I call them bloom tags. Here's one here. You know, basically after the bloom is finished out and the bowl starts developing, sometimes that, that, that flower stays stuck to the tip of the one, two, three, even 10 day old bowl sometimes and they dries out. And then these get, when, when they're towards the top of the canopy, you end up with hundreds of these in your bag. Makes it a little tougher to sort. I should say this is Victoria, our intern from San Luis and Mexicali. Um, she's volunteering in our lab this year and she's sorting through the sweeps I took before we started the session and we will talk about the results out here. So, again, angle of attack, vertical slightly open, depth about an air pocket three inches or a fist above, enough force that you're, you're um, getting some leaf breakage into your, into your um, bag. Now, I was talking to a PCA this year, actually, very seasoned, very good PCA, and he made the comment, which I hadn't heard before, because we don't often talk about our tools. You know, we talk about the management all the time. You know, what do we do, what do we spray? And he was saying, you know, I'm getting broken terminals in my, my sweeps because my, because my grower's not got picks on this. And so he, he used that as an indicator that sometimes uh, when, <laughs> when, you, uh, when the plant is very aggressively growing and putting on very long internodes and it's very green and lush, those are indications that you need a plant growth regulator like picks or which we don't have anymore, right? We have Pentia, we still have Pentia, right? Yep. Pentia. Uh, we have, someone has Pentia. Someone has Pentia, Mepiquat. Um, so that, that, I thought that was an interesting observation. When he started breaking a few terminals, it meant that the, the, the top of the plant was a little too green, a little too elongated. There's really only one other aspect of, of sweeping the foliage that matters. Maybe some of you have already read it. Maybe you know what it is. Anybody know what, the, what, what, what I haven't talked about? Capturing what you got in there. Yes. Yeah, but I got, I've, I've got one what? question. Is, okay, question, time, Gordon. Time of day. You know, ah. the entomologists, we usually start at sunup. Yeah. Cotton's typically wetter. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. as the day progresses, I've heard other PCA say, well, Maybe I'm catching more as the day goes on, like yeah. 11 o'clock in the morning, yeah. noon. And I was gonna ask you, because it's been on my mind sometimes, because yep. sometimes early in the morning you'll have light counts, but then you'll shift through, dig through uh, blooms, squares, young bowls, and you're finding ligus nymphs. You're like, okay, is 
Mm -hmm. It's a plants, what am I not getting enough? Or mm -hmm. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. So did everybody hear Gordon's question? It's about time of day which wasn't the point I was going to make now, but let's answer that question because it's very important. You guys need to know when you can do your job. And the, the answer is we don't have a precise study that answers that, but in the, um, in the course of all the research that we've done, we've not found any appreciable difference between dawn, pre-dawn, sweeping, up to mid-afternoon. I had PCAs years ago kind of ticked off that I mentioned that you can go out there mid-afternoon and get basically the same counts you can at 6 a.m. Because they didn't like, you know, a, a grower second-guessing them and saying, go out there and do it again. Well, who wants to go out there 3 in the afternoon and, and get another set of 100 sweeps? Um, so the answer is anytime, anytime. But I would not discount anyone's individual observations, you know. Uh, it's true. In the morning, you're not going to have any open blooms. And by 10 o'clock, usually, you're finally going to have that day's blooms open. And it, it could change the dynamics a little bit. But interestingly enough, that, that, that top 12 inches remains pretty consistent, pretty consistent. So um, any time of day. Yes, sir? Wind conditions? Wind conditions. You know, I've heard people say you can't sweep in wind. I don't know. I don't have any problem doing it. You just got to sweep into the wind. You know, uh, it, you don't want to be fighting it. So we've actually done well uh, sweeping in wind. So you know, short of a dust devil going across the field, um, any kind of wind conditions will work too. Well, the, the last part I was going to mention is you always need to be sweeping a part of the canopy that hasn't been swept before. And especially with young PCAs, young trainees, I find sometimes they're so concentrated on, you know, Peter says I've got to have the angle this way, I've got to hold the thing this way, and they do a great sweep, but they're going like this and they're sweeping plants that have been disturbed by the previous sweep. Insects respond very, very quickly. If they see you coming and you're disturbing, you're vibrating the canopy and this next plant over is shaking, you cannot be sweeping that plant. You need to maintain enough of a pace through the, through the field that you're always sweeping undisturbed foliage. That also means don't walk into the field and turn around and sweep the, 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 the canopy that you just walked through. Walking through the canopy changes distributions of insects, for at least for a short time. So you always want to be sweeping undisturbed foliage. A subsample is 25 sweeps. All our guidelines here on this side of the border in Arizona are per 100 sweeps. Okay. Now, does that mean, Peter says, you must get 100 sweeps out of this field? Well, I think this field, I don't know how big this field is, but I think that's probably a good ask. But you guys are managing your blocks of cotton, and it could be you have four corners of identical varieties, planted same day, water all the same way, managed the same way. Think of it as a management unit. If you're going to manage two or three fields all together, fine. You're going to need 100 sweeps to make that decision. You take much less, you're going to make a faulty decision. You will make errors in your decision making. Um, 25 sweeps is a subsample. I don't know if anyone does it anymore, but I know a retired PCA used to religiously go with 33 sweeps. You can kind of imagine why. Um, I, I think you get too many sweeps in a bag, it, it start, you, you start compromising the sample, actually. All right. Uh, I mention this because in California, typically they publish your California guides, I think, Rich, you can tell me if I'm wrong, still on per 50 sweeps, don't they? So, um, you know, you can go other places in the world and we'll have different standards, but ours is per 100 sweeps. Any other questions before I do a quick demo and then maybe ask some people who've never swept, give this a try. Thank you, Gordon. Questions? All right, I'll show you my technique, okay? Now, I've been through physical therapy years ago uh, because I was just putting too much, too much pressure on my my swinging apparatus. And um, so I, I really recommend a two-handed sweep technique. I know there's some guys that go out with one hand. I can't do it with one hand. I just can't do it. Um, I've known PCAs, I don't know any currently, that used to even bring a strap and strap the thing to their arm. Uh, but I use a two-handed technique. I'm right-handed. I'm always sweeping on the right side of my body. I'm always putting my left hand as my engine down below, my right hand on top to control things. And, and my sweep is always next to you. It's an unnatural, it's an unnatural motion. If any of you are golfers, I think golfing is an unnatural motion, right? But once you've done it several, swung it several thousand times, it starts to feel right. You know, you kind of got your center of gravity all out of whack. 
Um, so if you feel awkward doing it, that's you're probably on track. You know, it's like swinging a golf club for the first time. Peter, is there any time that you have to use a different angle for the sweeping? Yes, there is. I'm glad you asked, because this is a field where that's true. Uh, but let me uh, let me mention a couple things. First of all, uh, as I said, it's 25 sweeps. You got to keep count. I've had people go sweeping in there and they lose track, and you know they've come out with 27, 28 sweeps. I'm counting them, and they think they did 25. The other thing is, what is a sweep? Okay, I, I should have started right there. A sweep is one motion across the canopy. One motion across the canopy. So there's the, the, the sweep that's coming towards you, and as you're walking down, down the furrow, there's a sweep that's going away from you. Those are two sweeps. Don't, don't forget that, all right? Angle of attack. You know, um, when I'm teaching beginners and my technicians, I really tell them to exaggerate about loosening up your body. Because the only way to get across a 40 inch width at a vertical angle is if you're willing to release your right arm and let that arm take that net all the way out here. And so you can pull it through. And I think of this as my engine. I don't know why, but I think of it's like rowing a boat a little bit. But you gotta loosen up this elbow and this arm, at least when you're first learning in order to do this. Now, after a while, you know, you, you figure out what works best for you. And uh, I have had technicians that, you know, just have these wild, exaggerated motions through there. Well, I don't know about you, but after about my thousandth sweep, I want to get really efficient. Huh? You no know, one wants to use more energy in the middle of the summer than they have to. So a compact, uh, efficient swing is best. But hey, if you're, you know, whatever, you're a triathlete and you just, you know, you don't mind going all around and having flourishes, as long as you accomplish the goals we described, you're fine. But as the plants grow up, you know, early on it's easy to just get it here and keep it vertical. As the canopy closes, it's actually kind of a challenge uh, for such a tall person like myself and some other people to really get out there. So one little trick is to kind of change the angle of your, your net. And it's best if we go over here and look as I do it. And that way you can sort of sweep a, a very gentle diagonal across the canopy rather than having to go way over here to pull it through. It's easier if I show you than, uh, than describing. Any questions before we go over here to the side and I, and I show you my technique and... One. Yeah. We feel like this. Are you gonna get a fair bit of variability between the perimeter of the field and the center? Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah, that's, that's really fundamental and, and so we should talk about that. Edges inherently behave differently than centers of fields. Now, we can debate till the cows come home what, a, what an edge is. You know, you just sort of know it when you see it, right? Depends on the size of the field and everything else. So, no, I'm not gonna sweep the first six feet of this field. I'm gonna go in 25 paces. I probably wanna be in a field like this. I probably wanna be a good 50 rows over before I go into a field. Unless you have some sort of obtuse reason for managing your edges separately, and getting samples there, I would otherwise avoid your, your edges. Now, I, I know I get stories from PCAs all the time. They go out there and say, no, no, the numbers are fine. You know, I'm below threshold. And then he goes out with a grower and they sweep on the edge and, or, or maybe they're looking at white flies and they're, and they're really heavy on the edge. And the grower's like, oh, what do you mean? You know, well, that's not the whole field. If you want to manage the whole field based on 10 to 15% of its area, go ahead and do it on the edges. But otherwise you should be in the mass of the, of the field? Great question. You should also be uh, picking different rows, right? What I'll, what I'll typically do is I'll go out, I'll get, to, you know, I'll get to my starting point, I'll go out, I'll get my 25 sweeps, I'll then work my way across at least a half dozen to a dozen rows over and then get another 25 sweeps walking in. Then maybe, uh, you know, if I'm working in commercial fields, I'll hop in the truck and go to another part of the field, get another two times 25 elsewhere. Do you avoid trials in the field? Do I avoid like, trials? Like if there's trials, like if there's trials, you can kind of different Variety things. trials. Like, uh, or trial variant we see trials. that a lot in the lettuce. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because can it be resistant to something, or whatever the trial may be, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I run trials all the time, so we have to sample them, but I guess you're saying like commercial variety trials. Um, it's true, cotton, behave, cotton is an incredibly dynamic and plastic crop, so some varieties are gonna load up with pests earlier than others. So unless you have a specific 
goal in mind, um, I would avoid them and work on the, on the base part of the field. On the other hand, like with Wi-Fi control, sometimes it's a good early detection. You know, maybe you would go out and you would um, sample there to know how early white flies are getting started. Yeah. Other questions before I do a quick demo? Yeah, Gordon. One thing I noticed, uh, and especially in Yuma, you have field variability. You might have a 40-acre block of cotton, but yes. you've got sand streaks that run yes. through it. Or, or, and now you're asking all those nuanced questions. <laughs> Where should you sweep? Where? What should you well, do? Well, and that's the other thing, because you can, like right now, some cotton is going through cutout, and you can sweep right through those areas where the cutout and have zero ligus, but you can go 20 feet over where the cotton's a lot more lush, and yep. still growing, and yep. your ligus counts are through the roof. Yep. So you yep, got to. Yep. It depends on what you're trying to do, and, and only you know that. But if it were me, like this field, when I came in yesterday afternoon, the east end had a little, it, it's, it was wilting down over there. I don't know if it's a little sandy or, sandier there or not. If I'm interested in ligus counts and I want to know what's the maximum that can be there, I'm going to go where it's growing. And I'm going to go where it's growing and where it's flowering. I'm, I'm going to avoid um, skippy parts of the stand. I'm going to go, avoid uh, stressed parts of the stand because I want to know sort of maximally what could be happening here. But, you know, as the balance in your field changes and most of it's stressed and less of it's aggressively growing, you may, you may swap that. And for the other major pests, white flies, I actually go the other way with it, right? White flies is a stress-loving insect. Uh, Ligus don't want to have anything to do with stress. They want to be in your vigorous, well-growing cotton, flowering cotton, but you'll find white flies wherever it's skippy, um, wilting down early, stressing early, that's where white flies are going to load up first. So I'm going to go there and check that out. Peter, is there anything different about sweeping alfalfa or are you going to talk about Absolutely. That? Everything's different. <laughs> Everything, and that's why Iman's here today. No, and, and yeah, so I'm only talking about cotton here. Okay. It's really important for you to know. Uh, Dr. Mustafa will be going over the alfalfa sweep, which is a very specific sweep. Now, I'm lazy. I'm a cotton guy. When I go in alfalfa, I just sweep it like it's cotton. But I'm not going to be able to use Iman's guidelines properly from those counts. I can maybe see what's going on. You have to sweep the alfalfa sweep. We'll go over that in a minute. I, I didn't mention it, but even a bag, even the way these bags are sewn can be a little bit different. And sometimes there's a ragged side or an unfinished side. And sometimes there's a more smooth seam. I always want my smooth seam on the inside because I, you know, when you're doing thousands of these, you do not want to be searching through the seam, trying to get bugs out of there that are lodged and, and decide if they're first instar ligus. So put your finished seam on the inside. My, my finished seam is right here. I'm going to put it on the inside of my bag where I'm going to catch my insects. All right, I'm going to go this way and then I'll, I'll come back and do another set. All right. Another thing I probably wouldn't do is be sweeping the dusty part of the dusty corner of the field. Uh, but that was the basic technique. I don't know if you saw, this isn't that tall right here, but I modified my sweep a little bit if you get behind me, where I was sweeping at a little bit of an angle coming through so I wouldn't have to necessarily go out like this. I kind of turned a little bit so I can keep my arm in here and go across that way in order to maintain that vertical Vertical thing. Kayaker Vertical. would call that a high brace. Is that a high brace? I never knew what that was. High brace. Now I snap things down. Everybody has their own technique. I don't know why, but I think it's like a sneezing mood. You gotta, you want to stop short and let um, centrifugal force put everything in the tip, pinch it off. For research, we're putting everything into a Ziploc. Technique for doing that as well. Everybody else, I do this get it under my arm. I'm still holding that. I'm not releasing the sample till I'm ready. And then I'm going to open it up. Pardon the analogy, but it's like a sphincter, all right? You're opening up the sphincter here and you're allowing a little bit of the gas to come out, all right? A little bit of gas comes out. I do this first uh, 
for a moment I wait because often the Ligus adults, not all of them, but they'll be sometimes the first things that come out. I haven't seen any Ligus. I've got plenty of material. I've got all these darn stinking dry bloom tags, which I don't like to fool with. Do have to quickly look at them. Um, got predators, there's a one day old bull. You know, there's things going on in here, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing it this way, but just to give you a sense for how much material is in there, most of it bloom tags, couple leaves, couple squares, and one day old bulls. That's a tough, with all the broken bloom tags, this is a tough thing to look at, but as a last step for me, my eyes have gotten older, just like the rest of my body. So I'm going to have a loop with me all the time, and I'm going to take a look at the seam. I'm going to look at anything that looks a little bit like it's electric green, because that might be a small ligus in there. Uh, but I'm often looking down in that seam. Just give it a quick look to make sure I haven't missed anything. Bang it out. Put your finished seam back in there. Go get another 25 sweeps. Questions? So your jeweler's loop is an essential piece of Absolutely, absolutely. I only have a limited amount of time on the program, so we will move on to on the, on the numbers on this. But any brave souls that have never swept before want to take a whack at the field here? Sure, why not? Let's see what you can do. Remember, it doesn't matter what you look like. It's just the goal, what you're trying to do. You're not going to hurt the plants. Go, go at it. All right, that's good. Critique, what is he doing right and what's he doing wrong? Not enough force. Not enough force, that's overcome easily, right? That's just the first time out. He'll, he'll, he'll get that, but how did he do like, how was his angle? How was his angle? Well, I try to keep it vertical. Probably was anybody watching? Started out a little shaky, it got better. Yeah, I thought his angle was excellent, actually. You were concentrating on that. Um, so your angle was great. Started a lot, he started out a little high, right? And then he started getting a little deeper and he probably needed to go just a tad deeper. Okay. Um, but you know, you, you were concentrating on technique, you're, you're there, you know. The nice thing about this, and some people don't like, like me saying this, it only takes a few hours of training and then maybe a few times out, a couple times out, before you can, pretty much anybody can do this. Now I'm not gonna say anybody can do what a PCA does. That's a tough job. Uh, that's that's the, what happens between the ears is so much more important. But as far as getting out there and getting that sample, um, I can train anybody to do this. The other thing I can tell you, I didn't start out on this, there has been research done on sweeping technique. And it concluded the exact same thing. With a, with a modicum of training, um, no matter how they look, as long as you're achieving that basic goal, results are very, very similar. So it's not like I can only look at Gordon's sweeps because they're Gordon's sweeps. You know, Gordon's will look like Rich's, which will look like Peter's, which will look like pretty much anybody else that's been basically trained. What was the other thing he wasn't doing? <laughs> the other mistake he made? He did a great job. Huh? He didn't turn. He started just doing one side. Well, that was when he was practicing, I think. Yeah, he was getting well, his bearings. You know, I don't see any point in and sweeping the same direction. If you have a, a row of a plants, you can sweep this way, and on the return, why can't you sweep the other way? You can, that's what you should be doing. Okay. But, but yeah. I will say, sometimes it's so windy. Someone asked about wind. Sometimes I can only sweep in one direction. I can only do it just the way he did it. I can only do this, because the wind is just so, so stiff. No, what's the other thing he wasn't doing, though? There's one key thing here. We finished on it over, over here in our session. Huh? Well, forget counting, but yeah. Speed. Speed. Like meaning no force. Covering, huh? No covering ground. There you go. Your sweeps are too close together. If I'm okay. if I'm disturbing that, I can't be sweeping here. I got to make sure I'm over here before my next sweep. All right. So yeah. you're talking about one sweep per meter, more or less. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yep. Good to know. Well, that actually looked pretty good. You just you know another hour out here, we'd have you checking fields all through Yuma. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments? 
This field, not right here necessarily, but this field's sort of at the edge of comfort for a lot of guys. You know, I feel like I'm back in T-ball when, when cotton gets to the stage because you're, you're swinging at, uh, at big bowls that are starting to set up top and they start breaking off in here. Some guys will stop sweeping at that point, but there's still information to be pulled out of here and we'll go over what we're finding. So up, up to what stage do you recommend sweeping so you don't disturb yield, or not yield, but... Yeah. Well, it's going to affect yield, but. <laughs> we, in research, we go up to cutout and beyond. We even go up to two weeks after cutout. A lot of people won't do that and, and, that, and I can appreciate that. It depends on the management decision you have to make. Um, our research would suggest that up to about a week, it depends on your production goals, but up to about a week after cutout, about a week after cutout, it makes, there's no economic sense in controlling ligus. If that's the case, you no longer need information on ligus. But now, white flies are a different thing. We also need information from the sweep net. We start out by talking how now predators are the name of the game. Let's go back over here and we'll talk about that. Peter, your definition of cutout, five or fewer. Nodes above white flower, five or fewer, yes. Technical cutout is zero, right? Nodes above white flower is zero, but no, at least one week after nodes above white flower at five. And at, and at a real five, not when it, you know, sometimes you get it to five and it's, then it pushes again, you know. So you, you, you kind of know when you're, you're in the final death throes of that primary cycle. If you're going for a secondary fruiting cycle, which almost nobody does in Yuma, you know, there may be a need to come out there a couple weeks after cutout. All right, the purpose of this session is to go over the sweep method, but there's many other sampling techniques, including direct observation. Um, Macy or people are passing out a, a, a one-page sheet that goes over how to sample white flies. And it says, in, it says in seven minutes or less. I can assess this field in seven minutes or less, and then I in fact did it before you guys arrived. Um, I did it by picking the fifth leaf down from the main stem. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because we don't have time today. But I went into the field, I turned them over, I counted the white flies or I counted the leaf as infested if it had three or more adult white flies on it. Then I broke it off and I walked to the side of the field with 15, a group of 15 and another group of 15 for a total of 30 leaves. Yeah, thank you. So Macy is holding our plant. This is wilting down, but nah, this, is, this is our terminal leaf right here. Cotton is a very organized plant. That's the terminal leaf. It's a little small. We may or may not count it. I like to see it be fully expanded into quarter size or bigger. And then each main stem leaf sets three-fifths of the turn around, almost opposite. So here's the next leaf. One, two, three. It's kind of tied up four. So here's my fifth leaf. This is the one I would turn over. I would examine it for the presence or absence of adults. And then I'd break it off. For those of you that do petiole sampling for fertility work, this is the first physiologically mature leaf and is typically the target for petiole sampling. One way you know it's the right leaf is because it snaps off. If I go for the fourth, the fourth is rubbery. It's not, it's, not phys, it's not physiologically mature. This is the first completely physiologically mature. So it depends, depends on your standard. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a nutritional expert. <laughs> so it'll snap off. But again, the focus of this isn't to teach this, but I'm, I, if you want to learn it, I'll, I, it's the same thing, I can teach it to you very quickly. Managing Arizona cotton really has become about managing the natural enemies, the predators that are in the field, the good guys that are in the field. We have a, had a revolution in technology over the last 25 years, and we have an industry unlike almost any other around the world. I've, I've looked at cotton systems all over the world, uh, nobody manages cotton the way we do here and with fewer sprays and with f uh, fewer sprays that are also quite safe. Very selective, safe sprays, safe to the predators, safe to the pollinators that are in the system. Uh, that's because in part of the research that we've done uh, to quantify, to finally quantify how many predators you need to be successful. Production companies like, production countries like Brazil, how do you get them to change from their current practice to the more favorable practices like we, we have here? Well, in fact, I've been asked to do that and I have been working with Brazil. I've traveled there um, twice in the last year. It's difficult. 
You know, it's difficult. Uh, some of the things that we take for granted here in the U.S. Are, are the most, I think, the most important thing about our system. Now, it may be a very self-serving comment to say it, but I think Cooperative Extension is a genius organization federally. It's implemented differently across the country, but Cooperative Extension, we have a specific mandate, which is to translate research into a form that you can use on a day-to-day -day basis to improve your life. Now, in the agricultural sector, that means helping you manage your lettuce, alfalfa, your cotton better. And so we have that institutional mandate, and that's my job. So I invest in it full time. I hopefully have developed um, a trusting relationship with the stakeholders here and around the state. And they see the research that we do. They see it demonstrated. They see it validated. And over time, um, people adopt it. I heard a PCA say, sitting here earlier telling another PCA, you know, I use that Ligus threshold because it works. I've used it for 20 years because it works. Well, yeah, it, it works because we did the research on it many years ago and validated it over and over again. You can't then just waltz into a country and say, this is the way you have to do things, you know. The way you're doing them is wrong. <laughs> how, well, how well would that go over? <laughs> right? <find> you. <laughs> and the problem is Brazil does not have even, a, even the equivalent to cooperative extension there. And, and a big part of our discussion and strategic planning with them uh, this past spring was to say, who's going to take responsibility for that interface? The very thing we are doing here today, who's going to do that there? Now, the industry in certain parts of the country steps up and they can kind of do it and they like to work with the biggest growers and, and you know, get the biggest bang for their buck. But there is no institutional responsibility, whether it's private sector or public sector. And so it makes it very difficult to achieve change. But I'm glad you asked about Brazil specifically because this past year, 2022, uh, we averaged 1.53 sprays all season long for insect pests in cotton. That was a low number and it was, not, it, was a, it was an easy year by most accounts. In Brazil, they sprayed 33 times, 33 times and with some very broad spectrum, very damaging materials. So there's a, there's a, it's a heavy lift to get them to where they need to be. Can you all see that? This is Pat Sajak and Vanna White right here. <laughs> all right. So I use this picture when we're in a darkened room and I, you know, an hour out here, I can't show you things that have gone wrong uh, in this field because things are going pretty well out here. But here something went wrong. That, 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 that strip, which is actually quite large, um, completely defoliated while everything around it is growing well. well. Why? Because an inappropriate decision was made there. It was made by me. And it was made on purpose to control ligus with a broad spectrum chemistry. Now, I controlled my ligus. I actually did what I intended to do, but then there's the, the world of unintended consequences, and that's in the form of the destruction of the natural enemies, the non-target effects of what we do every time we spray. And I killed out the predators exactly where I sprayed, perfect square, uh, and I paid for it. it the, they, the, the, I had a secondary pest resurgence of mite, or pest outbreak of mites, and a primary resurgence of white flies that put so much stress. These are foliar feeding insects that don't chew on the leaves. They just suck the life out of them to the point where this, this part of the field defoliated prematurely. It lost a bale of cotton as a result. Everywhere else, we elected to use a selective chemistry to control ligus. In Arizona, that means either transform or carbine. Those are the two selective agents we have for controlling ligus safely controlling ligus safely while preserving our natural enemies. I have no idea what's next. Yeah. All right, so we'll, we'll give you a chart. Are you all awake? Have you all had your coffee? All right. <laughs> when we talk about thresholds, and you learn about them in IPM 101, it's pretty static, right? Here's my threshold. If my pests are here, what do I do? Spray, I'm above my threshold. There's too many of them out there. I need to spray, I'm above my threshold. If I'm here, what do I do? Don't spray, keep scouting. Well, that, that's time tested, it still works. What we've done now, and the research I alluded to earlier, is we've quantified the natural enemy part of it. 
I'm only showing you minute pirate bugs here, which is a tiny predator, sucking predator. So here's our sort of normal threshold, sort of going down the middle of this graph. And now we, that's just the number of white flies. But now we've added predators on this axis and we've created a diagonal now because it's predator to prey. So as numbers of white flies go up, I actually need more natural enemies to tamp them down. So instead of being that horizontal spray, no spray, it's now this diagonal spray, no spray, and actually it has these little cutoffs. There's, there's a point at which you have so many white flies out there, it doesn't matter how much natural enemy activity you have, you need to spray. Okay, so there, those things do still happen, and we expect you to spray there. But it's a, it's a gradual thing. As my numbers are a little bit lower, I don't need as many predators. And as my numbers climb in white flies, I need more predators to do what I need to do. This is just a note that we expanded this in 2022 after doing validation trials. And the last publication we, we uh, passed out has the latest tables that includes this additional deferral zone. So if I'm over here with my white fly counts, but my pirate bugs are up here at 11 per 100 sweeps. I don't need to spray, I can continue to wait. We're gonna skip that one. Apologize, I did not get these in order. All right, so what are the predators that are important? These are them. We're gonna go through them one at a time real quickly. Green lacewing larva. I took this picture, uh, not my own photograph, I selected this picture because it's a first instar. That's only a few hours old. It just came out of a tiny egg. It's very, very small, but we count this in our sweeps because it's a key predator, okay? Through our research, we've determined there's about two dozen species that can eat another insect in, in an average cotton field. We're gonna count six of them, yeah. Overall length on that would be two or three millimeters? Yes, okay. two millimeters, okay. two millimeters. When it's right out of an egg. Now they get up to about five, six, seven millimeters, yeah. But it's only the larvae. Do everybody know what a green lacewing is? It has kind of the netted green wings. Those things don't feed. The adults don't feed, so we don't count those. We only count the larval stage, all right? These come off in your sweep net. This is one of the ones you have to count. That's why the sweep net's so important. It's why we're here today. This is the other bull worker out here, the minute pirate bug. It tells you something, right? It's small. Aureus is the genus, Aureus or minute pirate bug, or chinchiparata, okay? This is the adult. It has kind of an X black and white look to it, even better in a net, but the immatures are completely orange, okay? Completely orange. We count them all. If it's an adult or a nymph, they both are voracious feeders, they're excellent egg predators, they'll also feed on nymphs. That's what she's doing right here. These are white fly nymphs. We're not going over the whole white fly thing here, but white flies in their immature forms are immobile. They're fixed. Once the egg is laid and they hatch, they never move. They're a fixed resource and predators love them. They eat them like potato chips. And they're about, they're about as nutritious as potato chips because they're just sugar. A white fly is just extracting sugar and processing sugar out of the plant and they're eating them like potato chips, all right? The crab spider. I actually wanted to show this one last, but that's okay. The crab spider. So if you're a cancer, it, the crab, it's always literally with, the, with those front legs out in front of them. See that? That's diagnostic. You got a spider, it looks like that in the field. It's a crab spider. It's, it's specifically Mizumenopseller, if you want the species name. Excellent predator. All the predators we're counting here are generalist predators. What does that mean? It means they don't just eat white flies, they eat everything. And in fact, what is this one eating? Anyone know? What? Nope. Somebody said it. That's a Ligus nymph. So it's eating our number one yield limiting pest. So even though the numbers we're giving to you is for white fly management, we're, we're interested in um, the biocontrol services this pr provides in white fly control, but it's obviously helping us out across the board. We do not have specific relationships to our Ligus levels that are out there, but I can tell you if you're higher up on that scale, higher numbers of predators, you're probably getting some good Ligus biocontrol, mite biocontrol, you're getting all kinds of pest control 
from these generalist predators. Count every spider in your hundred sweeps. This is the Colops beetle. This one is Colops vitatus. That means striped. This one has two stripes. It's red and green or red and blue. It has two stripes. We also have a species that has four spots. Count them all. Those are all Colops. You're only going to get adults out there. The larvae live in the soil. Um, again, good predator. Tend to be more early season than late season. Then there's this guy, which is very small. And this is a small fly. And I don't know, did you find any drapetus? Like two. Yeah, not many drapetus out here, unfortunately. They were very abundant in central Arizona right now, but it's a little late in the season. Very small, I always say nervous fly. The family name is called dance flies, and they literally, when they're in, the, it, you push them through the net, they're literally going like this all through your net, okay? That's my imitation of drapetus, all right? Um, yeah, you like that? It's a new dance move. Uh, What's interesting about this tiny little fly is it feeds on the adult white fly. That is a white fly adult in its jaws. It has kind of cone-shaped mouth parts. It grabs them, plunges its, its mouth parts in, sucks them out, and drops them. Again, it literally eats these like potato chips. You can put them in a petri, put one drapetus fly in a petri dish of 50 adults. They'll all be dead at the bottom of the petri dish inside of an hour. They're, they're, it's really quite amazing. I, I swear they kill for entertainment. I've lost count. Is this our last predator? This is our last predator. This is a big-eyed bug. This is a um, really our, our stalwart predator out there. Um, they're out in this field. They're big-eyed bugs, and in fact, they do have big eyes on the side of their head. Even the nymphs are the same way. Nymphs can be kind of grayish, or they can be all black. There's a lot of variation two different species that we have here in Arizona. We count them all. Adults, nymphs, both sucking predators. We'll hunt down uh, eggs, nymphs, and larvae of other things and feed on them. All these are generalist predators. Those are the six of them, all right? And they're in the handout that we gave to you. These are what we now wish you to track in your, your sweeps. That's why sweeping has become even more important. What do we got here? OK. Do you have numbers yet? Okay. Are you counting? Yeah. Okay. We're still getting numbers, but, uh, so we'll talk about this. There are now six predators that you can track in your field. They operate independently. So if you have lots and lots of drapetus, just count your drapetus. That's the one that's going to be running the show, so to speak. They form a food web, and some become more dominant. Others recede to the background. Some may never show up. You don't need to be counting all six of them every time. You need to be tracking the ones that are abundant. And that changes through time, through, by field, by geography, uh, by growth stage. So they operate independently. And, and the point of this was simply to say that once you're at a certain level of white flies, and we'll go over this in a moment, you can observe the big eye bug threshold, which means I only need one per hundred sweeps to defer action, or two co-ops per hundred or four crab spiders per hundred, or 44 drapetus flies per hundred. Now that's for a specific level of white flies that are in the field. I'm going through this fast. It's all covered in your publication. That was based on, uh, that's four thresholds if, you, if you're with me, right? We just covered four thresholds. Here's four more thresholds that are based on the adults. The others were based on large nymph counts. These are based on adult white flies. Two lace wing larvae, four crab spiders, five aureus, 26 drapetus. Doesn't mean you need all those things, it just means you need at least one of those to reach that, what we'll call an inaction level, right? You're gonna defer the spraying. You might go out there in your first 25 sweeps and find four crab spiders. And if you already knew what your white fly levels were and you needed four crab spiders, you wouldn't have to take the next 75 sweeps. You'd already know you have enough crab spiders in the field to defer your white fly spray. Are we getting any closer? Yeah, that's it. All right. Whew. Victoria's been working very hard back here. All right. So, everybody, I need a, a publication. Where did those publications end up? The last one, the integrated one. Yep, perfect. I think I have five minutes, is that right? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So this is the last publication was handed out to you. It's called Integrating Chemical and Biological Control. 
That is what an average PCA is doing in cotton today. Even whether they know it or not, if they're tracking their pests and tracking their predators, they're doing their best to make a decision, an economic decision for their grower that will allow them to produce their cotton without damage from these pests. On the other side are our updated tables for these predator thresholds, all right? So, I went through and I did my leaf counts for the white flies first. So we're gonna work through this. I found five leaves that had a disc area with a large nymph on it. Again, not important what the sample size is, but let's look that up together. Do you all have your publication? On the left side are our large nymph numbers. On our right side are our adult numbers for white flies. That's the pest. What did I say, five? I've already forgotten, five. I counted 30 leaves. Five of them were infested with large nymphs. So let's look at that. What does this first row say? Number of discs infested with large nymphs. How many of them were infested? How many did I just say? Five. You scan down to five. Where does that bring you? It brings you to that first yellow line, right? Are you all with me? Yeah. So that tells me I'm 17% infested. That's five divided by 30. That's equivalent to 0.3 large nymphs per disc. This is extra information you don't have to know or memorize. It's here in the table. But what's important is how many predators do I need for this level of large nymphs to defer action, to defer a spray? So how many big-eyed bugs do I need? One per hundred sweeps. Just tell me if we found at least one big-eyed bug. We had, Victoria says we had at least one. We'll go over the exact number in a moment. So we could stop right there, say, you know what? I don't need to spray this field. That'd be a little dicey because there is another stage out here we need to review. And, and doing, making white fly control decisions requires information about large nymphs and adults. But nonetheless, let's go across to colops beetles. How many colops beetles do we need? One. Did we have any colops beetles? We had zero colops beetles in 100 sweeps. I told you, they tend to be more early season. They cycle out of our system a little later. You didn't have any out here, so if that were the only thing we were measuring, we'd be spraying, potentially spraying. How many crab spiders do we need? We had about 10. We had enough crab spiders. I'm going to go over that number in a moment. Drapetus flies, how many do we need? 14, 14 per 100. Did you find any drapetus flies? Um, not many? Not many. We did not have enough drapetus flies out here. So two of these thresholds were satisfied, two of them were not. But that's for large nymphs. I guess I have the numbers. I don't need to ask you, right? So. so does that mean you need a spray, or you don't spray? You're good if you have I'm good. I got at least one of my thresholds. I've, I've met my threshold for inaction, let's say. Now, but I would always recommend looking at adults. And when I was sweeping and when I was walking, I was like, ooh, here's a little pocket of adults. You know, there's a gap in the field, a little bit of stress. There's some numbers out there. So I ended up with 16 infested leaves with adults. We go to the right side of the table. Scan down to 16 infested leaves. You all see that? That's the second to last light green row. Are you all with me? So that's a higher infestation rate. That's 53% infested. That's actually an area of concern. I would consider this at a vulnerable stage, cotton is going to start to open. We don't want excess honeydew. We don't need contamination. So we're at 57%, I think, uh, or 53%. 4.7 adults per leaf is the equivalency. Now let's read across what we need to defer action. How many lacewing larvae do we need? Three? Three per hundred. Victoria's counted 10 per hundred. 10 lacewing per 100. You could stop there. Say, well, there's a good number of adults out here. This is, there's a, you can walk into areas of this field that would make some PCAs wince a little bit. But they're pockets. It's not the whole, whole field. Uh, but there's a lot of lacewing larvae. How many uh, crab spiders do we need? We had 10. 10 crab spiders per 100. So we, we've satisfied that one as well. How many minute pirate bugs did we need? 
How many? Eight. 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 Ocho. We had 21 minute pirate bugs per 100 sweeps out here. 21. That's a lot of pirate bugs. So we're good there. And then how many trapedus flies did we need? We had two. Okay, so there's no co-ops, there's essentially no drapetus out here, so four of our six species aren't operating. I mean, two of our six species aren't really operating, but the other four are quite busy out here. They're very busy out here and they're, and they're working to prevent damage. So even though we would have, uh, if we were roll back to 10 years ago when we were running these workshops, we didn't have these thresholds, and I had this level of adults, especially here in Yuma perhaps, there'd be a lot of people saying, you know, Let's pull the trigger on this, because I can't tolerate this level of white flies. But now knowing that you got this biocontrol potential out there, you can safely say, no, I'm in that area of that curve where I can defer and, and not spray. Went through that very quickly. All this was to reinforce how important the sweeps tool is. It's not just about counting ligus anymore. There's other things you can watch in there, and now we have quantified the predators that are important. Questions? How mobile are some of these predators? Pretty they basically mobile. Basically, move around and find these spots. Yes. Uh, Most are of them. Concentrations of white flies. Yes, you'll find them, and and usually high, they'll follow the white flies. You'll okay. see that happen, especially those little nervous flies. Those drapetus flies have a tendency to move wherever they are in the field. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are pretty mobile. Yep. How, how big are your discs? The discs are about a quarter size. A quarter size? I have a few loops here, they're that size, okay? We've affixed these on these loops. I'm placing it on the leaf and I'm looking in that area. That's all I'm inspecting for the presence of a large nymph. And I can do So our next speaker is also coming from Maricopa, came special down here just to teach us today about sweeping in alfalfa. Uh, Dr. Ayman Mustafa is currently the Interim Associate Director at Maricopa County Cooperative Extension. He's also the Area program Programmatic Agent and Regional Specialist for Entomology for field crops, mainly on alfalfa, corn, and sorghum. He works extensively with farmers conducting field research and pest management on the above-mentioned crops. He is also a faculty of the University of Arizona Entomology Department he leads the Urban Agricultural Production, Small Scale, and Beginning Farmer Program of Extension Statewide. Without further ado, Dr. Ayman Mustafa. Oh, thank you. Take it away. And thank you all. I think we'll need to go to the field just to save some time and to get to the action quite quickly. So just follow me. Come on in, guys. Come on in here. Maybe a little bit longer, but that's not the... The, 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 the height impact. This is a very well-worn one, so every time I'm using it, I'm trying to, you know, get the trim here a little bit straightened up. But one of the things that we want to try and first doing it here about the sweep net and why we are using it in alfalfa, especially here's the crop that we are dealing with, with right now. Mainly we have some of these insects that we are scouting. We can measure them quite easily with sweep net. We are talking about alfalfa weevil, which is like mainly during the spring and uh, winter time. We are talking about most caterpillars here, like Lepidoptera, like uh, alfalfa caterpillars and uh, uh, army worms. We are talking about also some of the leaf hoppers that we are having here as well. And more importantly, we can also look at some of the natural enemies in our bags. With all of these insect Many research that we are doing here, like 90% of the research around the world, the method that is used for this sweep net is what we call the standard 180 degree. So it's like almost half a, half a circle. And that's what our research is based on. That's most of the research that we are talking about with based on the 180. And this is quite frankly one of the struggles that I'm having with some of our you know, PCAs. Because of the pattern that we have with cotton for like the eight or like the infinity, whatever like you are calling it, that might be what they prefer sometime. Some of them invented like a new one. I'm, I'm counting about three of them in my head right now, who is going with 160. 
I don't know why, but every time I'm trying to follow them, I get dizzy. So it is not easy to do this, and I don't know what kind of research that they are based uh, this on. But all of what we are doing is the 180 degrees. And in one of these, you know, publication here, this is a publication from our neighboring uh, UC Davis here. They are talking about, you know, everything about the 180 degrees and how we are using them and what insects you are using them as well. So you guys should have these as well. And some of the information here I should tell you, tell you it's, it's wrong. And this is about the threshold for alfalfa weevil. We'll talk about that a little bit later. We did multi-year study and our uh, current uh, threshold for alfalfa weevil is quite different here. But this publication mainly will talk about what we can do with this sweep net. Few important things that you can deal with when you are when you are dealing with alfalfa. The first thing, as as Peter said, you need to hit you know with the bottom of the brim first, not the not the upper area, because that this way you will collect some of the insects. When you are dealing with with the alfalfa, because it's like a shorter crops here, you will do what I call the golf you know knees. You will knees a little bit here, and you will get your you know lens going over this canopy. The other thing is where you hit. Mostly the upper eight inches of the crop, 10, 10, 10 to eight inches of the crop. Because most of the time, if you will do that, you will get nothing. If you'll go very down to the ground, you will collect a lot of dirt. So you don't do either of these. Most, mostly what you need to do is something like that. This is mostly what you need to do all the time. At this, at this strength, you don't need to go like swiftly like that. The insect will fly before you are hitting anything. If you didn't collect some materials after you hit the five sweeps, you are not doing good. Okay, if you like, if it's full with material, you are doing too much and you will hurt yourself. With alfalfa, it's very easy to hurt yourself because you are going with this 180 most of the time. But the good news is most of our research showing that these five sweeps like for each of these quadrants of any field would be good. So your first thing to do is to have like a field like that. Virtually you will have it like four quadrants or like four areas. And from each of this area, you will hit and you'll get your five sweeps, total of 20. And based on this information, you will get your count in the sweeps. And that's how you will end up with your number at the end. Okay, so we'll go with 180 most of the time, as I said, and this is mostly like you would go from, you know, the side of your body. And there is a lot of work on your wrist with this kind of sweep net. It's not only like you are using your eight or like infinity sign. You will go like with the 180 and trying to hit this upper eight inches or like 10 inches. And you still having some materials there, you're having some of these sweep nets. So how you do that is based on, again, the field and how much you are going through it. But mostly you will go one hit or one sweep, you get a, a step or two and you're going like in a zigzag area. So if you will end up in the right, you go to the left and they end up in the left and you're going to the right like a zigzag until you cover the quadrant with this five and you go to the next one. Okay, so this is mostly what you are doing with it. And for many of these, you know, times that you end up with these uh, materials there, it would be very hard to count them just while you are, while they are in the sweep net. You might need to have like some uh, Z block back. Do we have someone one in this, this sweep block? So I'll just like go as much as I can in terms of what we are doing. And from there, we can, uh, we can figure out what we are getting there. So. So as I said, if you didn't hit some of these materials, that's mean you are doing a little bit light. If you're getting a lot, you are still having some. Same technique as Peter mentioned, you will be trying to get this stuff outside. And with the bag here, you will get them inside. I like to do is slap my thigh and get it, get it down to the bottom. 
Okay. If you are not going to freeze them, make sure that you have some air. It will help you a lot when you are looking inside here. So we have some of the stuff that we are having here. So at this time of year, you will find that you have a lot of ligas in this field. And we know after this cutting, where this ligas will go. It will go, of course, to the neighboring uh, uh, cotton here. But mostly, if you look at this out of like the number of uh, ligus bugs, you will see like we have a lot of natural enemies as well. So we have a lot of these, and we have some of these bags. If you if you just uh, we can like distribute them around, and you can see like we have a lot of these natural enemies that Peter was just talking about, like the navid bugs. We have some of the lace wing. We have crab spider. We have like I can see from down here many pirate bugs even big eyed, and we have at least one of the collapse beetle as well. So we have like a very good population here of natural enemies. And actually that's why majority of the, the, the cotton field early in the summer, we are like not that early, but given that we were like colder a little bit early in the season, but this season a little bit different. It gives, you know, natural enemies gives a lot of control to insects pest in the summer. So they are feeding mostly on the, the, the young larva for uh, Lepidoptera that we have here. They can feed on some of the uh, leaf hoppers. They can feed also on some uh, other uh, insects that are there. I will feed it each other if they didn't find any. So at this time of year, most of what we have is like some of the caterpillars that we have, Lepidoptera, and we have mostly like two groups but we, we, we ended up with like more the last couple of years. But mo mainly we have alfalfa caterpillar, which is like a, a butterfly. That's why we didn't like, we didn't catch many of them because they are flying in the more like during the day. But we have also like some of these, you know, some of these moths here. And these moths are for the army worm. And we could catch the, the, the moths here because they are resting during the day. They don't fly, they fly at night. That's why we're being able to catch them. In some of these bags that we collected early, we can find some of uh, the caterpillars, you know? So it's still, it's still young. And that's how many of these natural enemies can deal with them at this uh, earlier stage. And it's quite good indicator that we have that much of these natural enemies as well. To go back to the question on time, at the time you want to do your sweeping, does it matter for uh, for, for alfalfa, it matters, it especially like during the, the, the spring and winter time. You don't want to go early in the morning. You will collect a lot of water, and that will not be good and will not be accurate as well. During the summer, it's not that, that critical. So in, in, in this publication here, this is dependent on some older publication we, we don't rely on. It's from 1975. It's coming from like northern and some uh, central part of, of California. It's not applied to our conditions here. And there is like some more information about like the large and small larva and how to distinguish of them with this pamphlet here as well. So One of, which stage is the most amateur? That's mostly like after the third instar of the larva, what we call the, the larger larva. That's like what they eat the most, and that's where we can find a good relationship mostly between this population of large larvae and the yield. Yeah. So one, one of the things that I, was, uh, I, I talked about and we were like just started to investigate in alfalfa is the relationship between natural enemies and the de decision making that we have. So for example, we know that in something like alfalfa aphids, we know how many of these aphids might do the damage, okay? So in, in, in alfalfa aphid, we count the population based on the number per stem, not sweep net, okay? Because it's easier, let's put it this way. For, for many years, uh, we were like trying to tell people that it's easier to count the number of this aphid bear five, uh, bear five stem from each quadrant of the field rather than like taking five sweep nets. And we did some study for like a couple of years to compare the sweep net to the stem numbers. 
And we found that there is a relationship actually. So, but it's like tenfold, per sweep. So if you are going to count the number per five sweep, it will be 500. So it's easier to count per stem, and that would be like the number that you might have. We have some guideline for the relationship between aphid population and the damage to the yield. And that's, you know, dependent on the species of aphid. What we don't have is what is the relationship between all of these and natural enemies that we can find a lot in an alfalfa field like this one. So that's what we are starting to do with Avik here and the, uh, the project that we have with Utah State University. We were like trying to Im involve and implement this natural enemies population into the decision making of alfalfa. We will start with aphid. We have like plan also for alfalfa weevil and hopefully we will have also for the caterpillars. Because for caterpillars mostly, they are managed by some parasitoids, by, by some of these insect parasitoids that, you know, can eat on the larva. And most of the time, unfortunately, we don't have much of the caterpillars here, but you can come later on and you would see like some of these caterpillars, the green one is swollen a little bit and it's whitish, not green in the body. If you like pull it apart and open it, you will find that, you know, larva or pupa of these parasitoids inside. And once you find that, that's your indication that you don't need to apply any insecticide. We need to quantify that. We need to know the number for this caterpillar. We need to quantify the number. Alfalfa is a little bit of challenging because you are almost having a new crop after each cut. So we would like also to put this in, in as a factor and figure out how we can manage based on the information that we can uh, collect, hopefully starting this season. It has to be some question, huh? Go ahead. The leaf hopper question. Um, sometimes I'm confused because you'll find a few and then all of a sudden the hay will turn purple and yellow. They'll have other fields and have more and nothing happens. It's, again, it's, it's depend on the species you have. Like for mostly what we see in areas like central Arizona, we have dominance of like the potato leaf hoppers. We barely see these kind of symptoms. But along the river here, it's quite, you know, you know, it's quite normal to see this kind of uh, symptom. And mainly because here we have more of the Mexican leaf hoppers. It's like more, you know, more toxic, it has some, some claim it has the virus, although there is no study to, to say that or not, or to uh, prove that or not. We need to do some, something here. But most of the time, the bottom line, we have more of the Mexican that's more destructive along the Colorado River compared to the other area of the production. That's why I was like telling most of the people when I get calls from here, most of the time the threshold that we are using is based on the potato leaf hovers. So all of this about like, you know, 20 to 30 is based on the potato leaf hovers. All the time I'm telling them like 10 is enough for the Mexican one. Anything across the Colorado River, 10 per sweep is, is really, that's, you know, could be your threshold. Again, it needs a little bit of uh, research to confirm that, but that's what we can, you know, see from our experience year after year. So should we assume then that, that it's Mexican staff Yeah, yeah, staff uh, yeah. I, actually, actually, we collected some st some from here. The problem is not many people are quite qualified to identify them properly. <laughs> we ended up with some money from the industry to identify about 1,200 speci specimens, and each specimen is $25. Uh. And we ended up, you know, with the population here is almost like. I should say between 89 to 92% Mexican. It's the very opposite in central Arizona. About 86 to 88 are potato leaf hover in central Arizona. Do you think 10 is low enough though? Yes, well, that's, that's, that's like from, at least from what we can get because if, if you go any higher, No, I mean, should we oh, maybe go lower than Oh yeah, oh yes, oh yes. I'm saying like this is like, that you cannot tolerate. You can go lower if you can. Problem is we don't have majority of the chemicals that even can control it. Maybe like Baseroid XL is our best bet based on my efficacy studies, 
but again, it's pyrethroid and it's not like yeah, broad spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Not not much of other insect can manage them as uh, insecticide. I'm sorry, manage them. Transform works very well on them. Mm -mm. Nope. Savanto. Nope. Savanto doesn't. Doesn't work. Nope. I have I have like in, in about three or four years of efficacy studies with this about 45 to 50 percent mortality. That's it. Versus the Bay uh, Bayroid XL, you can reach the 85, 88. Yeah, quite good in knocking down. At at certain point, I was like talking to one of our growers, and he said, "Oh no way, that will work." But I will try it because he said so. And what he did is that he going spraying his field, and then he shut down the nozzle for like section of the field. And we came back later, and we have this famous picture that's taken by him, by him, with like very different color between the two. So it is working even like on, um, we can prove that with our result and with our commercial result as well from our PCAs. What about Syngenta's new material? Which one? The uh, I didn't. I didn't try that yet. Yeah. yeah. That could be, yeah, depend. But again, like at this, at this time of year, you would like to utilize as much as possible of the natural enemies we have. With like a field like that, despite that, you know, the only thing is like Ligus bugs, but I don't think this is a seed alfalfa. So we don't have much problem. The problem will be like to the following, you know, the, the neighboring uh, field here. But with that much natural enemies here, you are safe. And even I can see some of the parasitoids that can, you know, infest some of these caterpillars too. Problem is there is not much population of the caterpillar around. So this, you know, parasitoids might miss the opportunity here. So if anyone like would like to practice the sweep nets here and like we can go together or like doing anything about the 180 or whatever pattern he's using and he wants to change it, I'm here. Look, I am left-handed, but I have no supination on my left wrist, okay. so I find it very, very difficult and very yep. tiresome. It is, it is, it is, I agree with <laughs> I you. I can't supinate, I can't turn, so... But most of the time you can, oh, because you will step, yeah. The longer one is like, will, will help you better, yeah? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Can we get one here? Either one, yeah. Yeah. The, the reason we can like we, we wanna like go back and forth is because we can like use both of our hands. But okay. if, if we are using one based on you can you can go one direction. If which I'm, is even easier for you. Okay. So, so which is easier to, for you to go? So I'm, if, if, so if I'm left-handed, yeah, so, yeah, so this way. Okay. Okay. And it's and, and, and you should like start with yourself like, like this. parallel to your body like that, okay. and we'll 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 have it a little bit, you know, tent like this one, okay. and we'll just you know go until we hit the other, uh, other side. Of your side. Okay. So okay. Can you bend the knee? Uh huh. And hit. No, that's not good because we didn't hit the eight inches, right? Okay. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. So eight inches from the plant, right? Yep. <laughs> and like a swing at the beginning until you get the head. Okay. There you go. A little bit lower, but that's okay. And then we then? no no you did it a little bit lower. Oh, too low. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then you you, you still want to go like from the side all from the way this down. side. You still can walk it and like. And we have one. And we have two. We have three. <laughs> and we have four. And we have five. So instead of like going like that and going back and forth, I think no, that's just I you can you can it. no no that's fine you can go it's it's whatever easier for you. That's but neat, yeah. but bottom line is you need to get the 180. And you need you to hit the, whole the eight inches. Yeah. See, okay, like yeah, all I'm, the time we are talking about, you know, get some material in the bottom. Okay, everyone. We have a, a special guest. BASF has has come and graced us with their presence here at this event. Brought this wonderful trailer. 
brought these wonderful sweep nets that we can uh, bring home. Let's give them a round of applause for that, just, just that alone. Thank you, BASF. So our next speaker, uh, we're going to have uh, Jeff Boyston and Jose Cabrera uh, come speak with us. Uh, Jeff Boyston is a native Arizonian, graduated from ASU in 1978 with a BS in agriculture and agricultural industry. Started as a PCA with Wilbur Ellis and then went over to BASF. He's been working as a manufacturer rep for over 35 years in California and Arizona. So Jeff, can you raise your hand here? And we also have Jose Cabrera, who's worked 14 years with Syngenta in their seeds and crop protection division, as well as Helena Agra Enterprises as a proprietary product manager for four years. Most recently, he's joined BASF as a technical service representative role for coastal California and Arizona with responsibility for all technical elements, which include labels, product use direction, training materials, recommendations, and technical positioning of BAS products, BASF products within the territory. So today he's going to speak with us to give us a product update. So thank you, Robert. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, thank you for the introduction. And thank you, uh, Macy, for, for putting together also this event and inviting us to be part of it. It's uh, great that we have this, uh, this trailer that we can just move it around and it's almost like a, like a mobile banner that we can just take different wraps and just also promote some different products. Um, also, thank you for uh, Dr. Ellsworth, uh, great presentation. I was telling him that having Victoria in the background, like live data collection, yeah. that is just something that you don't see every day. That's just amazing. If we, if we would have more of there. this, that live data is just quite amazing. And thank you for just Dr. Mustafa too for the information on alfalfa. It's always great to be in the field. It's getting a little warm. Um, but I just wanted to give you some options. I just want to speak for about 10 minutes. Uh, Jeff is probably going to compliment also my talk because I don't have a lot of experience. I've only been in BSF for about eight months now. But Jeff has a lot of experience. We also have Ben Taylor here, our agronomic solutions advisor uh, from BSF. So, um, Jeff can also answer a lot of the questions that, of course, I'm not going to be able to answer if you happen to have any questions. So I always try to start so this a little bit. If you can see, the TV is a little bit shady because of the, the, the shadow there. But uh, a little bit of our agenda today, I'm going to talk about Safina and Versus. It's two products that you can see here, two banners. It's what we call in Scalis insecticide technology. So uh, when, I, when I talk about the the agricultural solutions that we have within BASF, uh, the word solutions is not always appropriate. I want to refer it as options. It's the same last, last few letters, but refer it as options instead of solutions. We have options. In some other places, some other parts of the world, they don't have the options that we have here in the United States. They have to do what they have to do. We hear complaints sometimes because we don't have enough products in the organic uh, agriculture. In some places around the world, they don't have products to just farm at all. They just have to deal with what they have, not to say with food and other items. But um, talk a little bit about the agenda today. I'm gonna talk about BASF options uh, for IPM technology. I'll talk a little bit about some of the products. I'll talk about some unique mode of action and characteristics. And then I'll show a really cool video because I think the video is uh, really cool. I hope that I have the Bluetooth speaker working and uh, also a little bit of visual crop data. So right on, some of, what are some of the challenges that we're facing in agriculture today, if you can see the screen? Uh, so we're cha facing a lot of insect resistance uh, within cotton and alfalfa and other crops. Resistance is always in our, in our vocabulary, so we're always trying to come up with new modes of action, you know, to battle that resistance. A lot, also, California, but also in Arizona, a lot of regulatory scrutiny. So regulatory issues sometimes prevent us from registering some products that we really need to use, that all that you guys need them. Regulatory, sometimes I heard tiny little shrimp in some places in California is preventing us from registering a really good, good insecticide uh, or things like that, you know, a little fish, but some things that we just need to work with regulatory and that sometimes is a little bit of a hassle. Uh, pollinator awareness, you know, that's important. We talk about all the beneficials, all the pollinators, and uh, also the, the insects uh, that we saw today, they don't only chew and suck and create a lot of physical damage, but they also vector a lot of viruses and diseases, like uh, melons, like what we have heard about INSB with the, Dr. Palombo, with thrips, um, 
I heard that in because I go to the coast too. Uh, that that's part of my territory. The trip uh, population is a little bit lower this season, so we might not see as much virus coming in from the coast on those transplants. So fingers crossed. Um, so what do we do for that? What do we do for some of these uh, issues that we had? So we introduce a new mode of action as far as BASF goes. We introduce in scales insecticide technology with Safina and Versys. They have the same active ingredient. We introduce a product that is soft. So that word soft is important because when you spray something that is broad uh, spectrum, you kill a lot, like Iman and Dr. Ellsworth said, you kill a lot of the beneficials. And then you can search a lot of your your past problems. So we create a product that is soft on those beneficial insects, really good product for pollinator. And uh, also, we introduce a product that is rapidly stops insect feeding. They rapidly stops insect feeding. We take that with a grain of salt, but I think I'm gonna show you a video that is gonna help me with that. So these are the two products that we have in that category. So for this uh, training, we talk a lot about the issues that we have with the pests, but this product, uh, Safina and Versus, they're really good for the beneficials. So you see some of the beneficials there in the picture. I don't know if you can read them, but uh, Ayman and, and Peter talk a lot about most of the beneficials already. So what is the mode of action behind this technology of uh, Safina and Versus? So cortitonal, I don't even know if, uh, you know, my, my Irish accent allows me to say some of these scientific names, but uh, cortitonal organs, these cortitonal organs, they act directly over the antenna and some of the joints of the insects. So there's a really um, important uh, factor that happens within the nervous system of the insect, which is the TRP channels. It's the transient receptor potential, banyloid of the insect, and it's located mainly on the antenna and on the joints. So what this type of product, Safina and Versys do, is that they act directly over those joints, over those antenna, and they make the insects start moving like crazy. They get sprayed and they can't stop moving. They start going into like some type of uh, dancing pattern. So what happened when an insect, and let me talk a little bit about the mode of action of Safina, it's a group nine. More, more further down, it's a group 9D per, uh, pertaining to the pyropenes family subgroup, and the active ingredient of this, uh, this product is a phytopyropene both Safina and Versus. So I'm um, not gonna talk too much about it. It makes the insect start dancing. So what happens when an insect starts dancing on a leaf? What is it not doing? Not it's not feeding, exactly. It's not feeding and it's, furthermore, it's not feeding and it's not transmitting diseases and viruses. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this. Hopefully this video speaks more than me. In this experiment, aphids are placed on the underside of parafilm to simulate the underside of the leaf. A feeding solution, simulating plant sap, is added to the Petri dish. The stylets pierce the simulated leaf in order for the aphid to feed on the plant sap. When aphids are feeding, their antennae are back and they remain motionless. When the timer reaches zero, the product is introduced to the feeding solution. At 10 minutes, the inscalis affected aphid can no longer damage the plant or transmit virus. At 15 minutes, the aphid has fallen from the leaf due to disorientation. Inscalis acts fast. A rapid onset of action quickly stops aphid feeding, resulting in healthier plants, optimal yield, and higher quality. The aphid exposed to the competitive standard will continue to feed and cause damage, depleting the plant of water and other essential nutrients, injecting toxins, and vectoring harmful viral pathogens. In Scarless Insecticide, redefine pest management. Performance without precedence. BASF, we create chemistry. What this, what this showed is that rapid movement. So you compare to the left, it's an untreated 
insect, an untreated aphid, then you have the aphid that was treated, then a competitor, and you see the aphid that was treated with in Scalis Technologies, Phenom Versus, it started moving like crazy, and then it, the time lapse went, and then it just fell. So it started moving, and you could see, I don't know if you noticed, but then the, the wings, the wings went up, and uh, they went up really quick, and that's a response that uh, this type of active ingredients cause in those cortotonal organs of those insects. So again, an insect that it is moving, it's not transmitting disease, it's not feeding. So um, a little bit about that. Uh, so uh, Dr. Ellsworth talked about ligus. So ligus is an important pest that has just recently been added to the Safina label. So Safina had um, suppression in the label before for ligus among the other uh, insects, now it's just being moved to control. So now if you look at any of the recommendation tools, agri and CDMS, whatever, it's now under the control section, uh, Ligus, which is uh, one of the things that we've been working for a long time. We're still working with Dr. Ellsward on, on a lot of trials to just understand where we fit. And he has that great chart with the different colors, that stoplight chart, that is perfect. I mean, that just focuses us um, and uh, just help us to redirect our attention to what kind of products and what kind of modes of actions we need to use at the different stages. So um, just li really quick, I have like about a minute and a half or so. I'm just gonna go really quick through, um, Jeff, you have some? Go ahead. Okay, I have, I have some, like a handful of data that I wanted to show you. This is from um, the Central Valley, some information on how Safina works compared to the untreated and compared to other products and activity for aphid control on cotton. So you can see here where the untreated is, and you can see where Safina is in terms of the upper tier. A lot of the statistical, statistic significance is uh, very, very limited within those products. So they all perform the same, but if you look at the untreated and you look at where Safina is, it's right on the upper tier. That was for, um, that was for aphid control. This is for white fly control, same. Uh, Safina is a great, great product for aphids and white fly control. And it is a great product for ligus. But we just need to gather more data, more local data. And also, one important word with ligus is yield. And that's something that Dr. Ellsworth is working with understanding how yield plays a role. Some of these products affect yield. So that was white fly. Also, again, this is ligus. And you can see where Safina fits in, in terms of how it performs compared to other products. And the untreated for ligus control. And uh, also, right here, uh, I cannot point it here, but if you see on the right that chart, it says the percentage of beneficials versus untreated, and then also spider mites versus untreated. So that is important when you think about the interaction between the beneficials. Alfalfa, Dr. Dr. Mustafa uh, showed us how to properly sweep sweep the, uh, that net and do the sweep sweeping. So uh, we have a really good label for Safina on alfalfa, and uh, you can see I'm not going to go, but all the different insects that it control. Aphid complex here in the desert is really important. Uh, blue alfalfa aphids are a really great product for blue alfalfa aphid. Uh, leaf hopper, both um, uh, that complex with potato leaf hopper. And now we have also the, that is not updated, it said suppression for ligus. Now it's control, both in alfalfa and in, and in cotton. So, um, Actually, I have one question. Is it more expensive, as expensive, or least expensive as it, it's It's, very affordable. Compared to, it's pretty competitive to the most common used ones. Yep. Safina yep. is. Safina is. When we, yeah, when we talk about produce, produce is a little bit of a different animal, but field crops, I think we're comfortable with where we're at. Um, a little bit of, again, uh, some data here on Safina, on alfalfa. I'm not going to bore you guys with data. I mean, for me, I think numbers continue to change. That's why I was so impressed with Victoria providing live data here, because one thing is having numbers over time, but live data is live data. Anyway, so this is just data. I just have like a, a few more seconds. And uh, just to reinforce, Safina and Versus provide rapid onset of action. You saw the video. It provides a unique mode of action. It's one of the, the few products in that mode of action, in that group 9D. And also the residual competitiveness, residual control is really important that we know that and also is gentle on beneficials and pollinators. So that's kind of my take home message. We have some options, and these are options that we can want to present to you. So thank you very much. If there's any questions. Yes, and thank you for letting us come today, and we're, we're happy to bring and drag this thing around. 
burn up some gasoline from around the state. Also, just one brief thing about BASF. This is our 154th year in business. So BASF has been around a long time, started in Germany. And a lot of the things we're wearing today were originally developed by BASF, such as indigo dye for your jeans, um, magnetic recording tape is a uh, patent invention of BASF, and uh, anhydrous ammonia. That process was originally developed by BASF. So uh, we ha are committed to agriculture, and in our division, about 65% of our profits go back into research and development to try to build a big pipeline. And it's more difficult all the time, but we're investing a lot in that. So thank you. Thank you. So for our last speaker of the day, last but not least, we have Macy Keith with San Agro. And I just want to say that uh, Today's workshop would not be possible without the efforts of Macy, uh, talking with Dr. Ellsworth nice. and organizing this and, and, and birthing this wonderful idea. And you know what, I think this is gonna be, have to be a tradition that we do again. And we can get some of those young PCAs out here who may have only learned in a classroom and from the old salts. So <laughs> next time, let's, get, let's, let's make a contingent. If you're a PCA, go back into your comp company and go to, get those whippersnappers off of vacation, get them back from the beach, get them back to Yuma and the cotton field where they belong. And let's, let's do this again next year. All right, so uh, get down off my educational soapbox and introduce our next speaker. So we have Macy Keith. Uh, she's graduated from University of Arizona in 2017 with a bachelor's degree in agronomy. She interned at the University of Arizona Extension, focusing on cotton IPM with Dr. Ellsworth, correct? Yeah. That's right. Only the best. And earned her AZ IPM license in 2018. 15. 2015. Yeah. She has been a product rep for San Agro for three years, specializing in organic production products. So you got your, you got your PCA license before you even graduated? No, I got my there? degree in 14, but that's 14? okay. Oh, we'll have to fix that That's, then. that's all right. Time All right. Is a little well, worry for me too, to be honest. <laughs> so she's a little more senior than than than, than what I said. I know. Now. I look freshly 21 and out of college, Robert. Thank you for that introduction. Hey, that's right. Well, uh, it's mostly they're mostly true introduction. Yeah. So thank you, Macy. And today she's going to uh, talk to us about uh, mixing uh, adjuvants and different products. And take it away, Macy. Thank you so much. Being organic, it's a very important. In comparison to conventional, probably you might get a little complacent with your tank mixes, but you cannot with organic. And it's important in conventional too. But for this to work, uh, it's critical that you're taking the steps. And, and in all IPM, it's important for that, like I just said. So the proper method for tank mixing is an easy acronym to remember of whales. And that is uh, your wettable powders, then you agitate, and again, you're introducing this to water in, t uh, in the tank. So you start with your water, wettable powders. You agitate that to get those wettable powders into solution. Then you introduce your liquids and your flowables. Uh, then your emulsifiable concentrates. And then the last step is actually your surfactants. And with suppress, again, because it's a fatty acid, it's hydrophobic in nature, and even in an emulsifiable concentrate, again, you know, we're limited on the inerts that we can use to make it uh, homogenous in solution. And so surfactant selection is important. Um, I'm not an expert in surfactants. I just know this is how my brain works. I like to look it in a jar, and the, hydro the hydrophobic properties are very easy to see visually. And so uh, the term adjuvant or surfactant, it's such a broad term, and lumping them into one category, it's not doing any justice for identifying the correct adjuvant in a particular tank mix. So one more thing I forgot to mention is before you're introducing the whales method, you must buffer for a suppressed application. You must buffer the water, and that happens before you introduce any chemistries. So it's the water in the tank. You buffer with whatever buffering agent. In this instance, it's going to be the BioLink acidifier, 50% citric acid, and then you begin the Wells method. So I'm just going to do a quick mix with two adjuvants that are compatible with suppress and one that is not. 
The one that is not compatible is a fantastic adjuvant in a different scenario where you're using something like nutrients where you really want it to stick around for a number of days. Uh, it's a pine based adjuvant and so the biggest issue you'll see it uh, is that fatty acids stick to that pine and they will separate if it's not properly agitated throughout the application and then that will reflect in the field because those fatty acids are sticking to the tank and so you'll see no kill no burn down and then the last 30 feet is just smoked because that's where all your actives were and so for me, it's as easy as just looking at it. I think it's important for your loaders, your mixers, your applicators, and your PCAs and growers to recognize this because you know these products are expensive and sometimes we only get one shot. So we just wanna make sure that it works. And I'll begin this and I'll pass around the jars so you don't have to come stand in the sun. So I have a, a jar, but this reflects um, 100 gallons of water. So suppress is a percent solution, so the volume of suppress you go is dependent on the water volume you use. So first, according to the Wells method, we introduce the citric acid. I'll stir it with my lovely glass stirrer. So suppress is an emulsifiable concentrate. It's easy. We're not doing a really big tank mix here, so I'll just Include the suppress at a 6% solution in 100 gallons. See the beautiful property of an emulsifiable concentrate in water. I'm just going to agitate it, although that's not according to the Wales acronym. Doesn't hurt to agitate. And this surfactant is our organic product called Xena. And I'll introduce that into the tank and mix this. And you can see, uh, this is ideally what you would like, is the fatty acids in suspension from top to bottom of the tank. And typically we prefer to have constant agitation in the tank. I like to say if you're driving around in a field, that's pretty agitated too. It's just you don't want it to sit very long and settle. So this is the Xena. I'll shake it up good too. We'll let it settle. Whew. Suppress is, uh, since it's organic, it's got a really unique smell. So this is another adjuvant. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to use active in or the, the names. It's nothing bad about this adjuvant. It's fantastic. It's just not great with suppress. Again, the citric acid in the water. I think you can tell us, so we know we should use that. Sure. Okay. Uh, this adjuvant that I'm not recommending with Suppress is New Film P and any pine based products like that. And here we go with the New Film P. Introducing the surfactant. New film P. I mean, just from the top here, I can already see the separation beginning. It's pretty visual. citric acid into the water. Agitate. Suppress 6%. And the third adjuvant, which works amazingly is Oro Boost, <laughs> and I recommend this in California over our Xena product which is a fantastic as well because we don't have a California label for Xena yet so I like to ref uh, to have this representation because if you're in California and you need an organic adjuvant with the press this is the one to go to
I'm gonna let him settle for a second. But the new Phil P, Manuela, do you mind bringing the Xena? Nope, it is just in the tank. So this is the new film pine and even just wiggling it around like that, this is all the active ingredients being stuck to the tank mix. Uh, not good because you want those actives to be applied um, evenly. You can already start to see the fatty acids, they split into like three layers when you let it settle for five minutes. It's not a pretty picture. It's been a disaster. I, I had to reverse engineer this from a complaint. And so this is our Xena product. And Xena is a great adjuvant for any solution. Uh, but you can see how quickly those fatty acids fall back down into suspension. Very, I mean, a homogenous, equal blend, milky throughout. So I know we're all hot and we want to leave, but I'm going to set these on the table. And as they settle, it will represent even more the difference. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. All right, you guys, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for our all-stars, Dr. Peter Ellsworth and Dr. Ayman Mustafa for making a trip down from Maricopa to teach us everything we need to do to keep it in the bag.